Hello all Royal Rangers, my name is Commander Matthew Kenslow and I'm over here in the United States of America and I've been a Royal Ranger for 20 years and year number 7 as a commander. Thank you so much for checking out this video. The purpose of this video is to go over a merit. In these videos I'm going to walk through every one of the requirements. Now it's important to note that while watching these videos it will not give you the merit. You have to show to your commander that you have watched and learned from these videos. What I recommend you doing is taking down notes for each requirement and then show them to your commander for approval. Some of the purposes of Royal Rangers is to build knowledge, wisdom, skills, and leadership attributes while learning about God's Word and conserving His resources practically and most importantly to have fun doing it. So I'm Commander Matthew Kenslow from the United States of America and be blessed. Hi everybody and welcome to the Railroading Merit. Let's begin with requirement one. Do one of the following. A. Visit a model railroading club. B. Visit a railroad museum. Or C. Watch a Pentrex train video. What is a Pentrex train video? Well, Pentrex uh, used to be a company before they merged with Highball Productions in 2017. And they produced um, magazines, books, uh, VHS videos, but now they put some of their videos on DVD and you could order them if you want to and just uh, watch one of their videos. Um, and that's if you haven't uh, visited a railroad museum or model railroading club yet. So again, just do one of the following. Okay, requirement two, do one of the following. Attend a model railroad show take a ride on a train, or visit a garden railroad. What is a garden railroad? A garden railroad is basically a model railroad outside in somebody's uh, garden, backyard, front yard, or part of the museum. So these are examples of a garden railroad. Okay, let's move on to requirement three. Make a list of ten railroad names, past or present. So I chose 10 of them. Uh, you're more than welcome to find more if you want. Um, I chose for the first one the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, this began back in 1862 and it spans over 30,000 miles. Before railroads, we had wagon trains and that's when people traveled in wagons being pulled by animals. The second one is the Central Pacific Railroad, which lasted from 1861 to 1885. Now what do these two railroads have in common? Well, maybe not have in common, but these two work together to create this huge project. What is it? Well, let's talk about it. The Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroad were both commissioned by the U.S. government for this massive undertaking in the 1860s. So watch closely of what happened. The first transcontinental railroad. So we have two different railroads or companies. We have the Union Pacific um, going westward and the Central Pacific going eastward. The Union Pacific um, started over in o Omaha uh, Nebraska right toward the border between Nebraska and Iowa and again they came um, from the east westward and then the Central Pacific uh, began over here by uh, Sacramento and came from the west to the east and this spanned 1912 miles which keep in mind this was in the 1860s and it was built between 1863 and 1869. As you saw in my uh, little animation that I made, uh, the map changed. And it changed from um, the map as it was in 1863 to the map as the United States was in 1869. And so what was the purpose of the Transcontinental Railroad? It was 
literally to connect the East Coast to the West Coast. And this was extremely huge uh, because the old way took maybe like a half a year and cost, you know, $20,000 in today's money. And now with the railroad, it took as little as eight days to get from New York City all the way to San Francisco, California for only $150 or less. And I believe that's $150 um, back in the 1800s. You see this little green portion here that was added later. Uh, I believe it took six months. And that was from the Western Pacific Railroad. And that connected uh, Sacramento to Oakland area near the uh, San Francisco Bay. So again, this was again a massive undertaking. It was so monumental uh, because it literally connected the East Coast to the West Coast. There were um, existing railroads like in uh, from this line that I'm pointing out and eastward. Um, if you know your geography, you have the Appalachian Mountain Range right here and over time people began expanding west and it was a period known as Manifest Destiny. Um, I believe uh, it really heightened in like the 1840s and people started to go west and the California Gold Rush uh, occurred and people started traveling further west and we started to claim a lot of these uh, territories over here and eventually emitted them as states. Here are a few ways to commemorate uh, the occasion that happened at this blue dot where both railroads met at. Um, it was called Promontory Point and it was uh, the event where the Union Pacific and the uh, Central Pacific met and they put in the last spike in this big ceremony. Uh, there's a neat YouTube video, I believe it's called Spike 150, uh, which commemorate this sesquicentennial or the 150th anniversary um, of this event. And I watched parts of it, they put on a big show, a lot of singing, dancing, and reenactments, so that's pretty, uh, pretty neat. So I remember in 2007 when this uh, coin came out, uh, the state quarter, uh, commemorating Utah uh, and then this is a stamp that also commemorates uh, the completion of the first transcontinental railroad. The actual picture is right here and again this uh, event took place on May 10th 1869. Okay let's talk a little bit about the Denver and Rio Grande West Railroad. Uh, the reporting mark is DRGW that's basically an abbreviation so you don't have to write the big long names everywhere. Uh, this um, was a former railroad from 1870 to 1988 and spanned almost 2800 miles uh, by the mid 1880s. Next we have the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad which opened in 1830 and ceased operations in 1987. This is the oldest US railroad, the first public railway for commercial use. Now I want you to notice Baltimore and Ohio, okay, the initials are B-O, does that sound familiar? The B&O Railroad? Yep, Monopoly. The B&O Railroad was actually used um, in Monopoly as one of the four uh, railroads. The thing is, is I believe that the B&O Railroad did not serve Atlantic City, which is what uh, Monopoly, the classic Monopoly, uh, properties are based off of. So again, the B&O Railroad didn't directly serve Atlantic City, New Jersey. But talking about the Monopoly Railroads, let's move on to the Reading Railroad. Yep, this also was a real railroad that lasted from 1833 to 1976 and spanned just under 1,500 miles of track. And of course, there's the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, which lasted from 1846 to 1968 and spanned over 11,600 miles. Now let's talk about some international railroads. Here's the Canadian National Railway that started in uh, 1919, currently spans over 20,000 miles and headquartered in Montreal. And it does appear to go down as far south as Louisiana in the United States. Next is the Panama Canal Railway. 
uh, that began in 1855. It's currently 47.6 miles a track, and this is kind of a bit like the Transcontinental Railroad, only much, much uh, shorter. This linked uh, one end of Panama to the other end. Now let's move on to uh, the Camrail. Uh, this is in the African country of Cameroon, which began in 1999 and currently spans over 300 miles of track. And finally, let's uh, talk about the Airport Railroad Express. This is in the Asian country of South Korea, currently under 40 miles of track, and this is a type of rapid transit uh, going about 68 miles per hour. Uh, so this is uh, getting beyond uh, the old way of steam locomotives to more electrical and we'll discuss a bit more about up-to-date technology later in this uh, merit. Okay, now requirement four is locate the Amtrak station nearest you. Now Amtrak is a passenger uh, railroad service um, so people like you and I uh, could ride on the Amtrak to go from place to place. Um, here's a current map of the Amtrak routes and it connects a lot of the major metropolitan areas like Seattle, Los Angeles, Oakland, uh, San Diego, Chicago, New York, Miami, and all around. It was founded in 1971 and currently serves over 500 destinations in 46 states and parts of Canada. You can see like uh, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver. Um, it's just not in Wyoming, South Dakota, Alaska, and Hawaii. It operates over 300 trains and has over 21,000 miles of track. And it could run as fast as 150 miles per hour. So here's how you could locate the Amtrak station nearest you. You go to uh, their home page, which is right here, Amtrak.com forward slash home, and click on destinations. When you do so, this will pop down. Right here, enter your zip code, and mine is 92627, and it will tell you the Amtrak station nearest me is in Santa Ana, just under eight miles away. Uh, so that's what you would do, write it down and uh, show it to you, your commander. Okay, requirement five is list six different types of freight cars used on railroads. So we talked a bit about passenger cars, that's where people like you and I ride for our transportation. But freight cars, what is freight? Freight is cargo or goods or merchandise. Freight is when you um, when you carry or transport uh, goods that ultimately reach our department stores um, or grocery stores. Uh, so that's example of freight. The first one I want to talk about is the box car. Here's a picture of one. It is fully enclosed to protect the freight inside. So the roof prevents anything from coming in or flying out, so it protects the freight inside um, and the doors are here on the outside typically. It carries a variety of freight, including paper, lumber, beverages, boxes, etc. Uh, lumber, uh, just in case you don't know, is basically um, cut wood, wooden beams, planks, and they're used for building structures and for construction. Uh, here's a bonus type of boxcar. It's the refrigerated boxcar, and this is when you um, are transporting perishable goods, things that need to be refrigerated or frozen. Okay, next is the flat car. Uh, the flat car is, well, flat. It's a flat open platform. And this is used to carry oversized and oddly shaped freight, such as machinery, military vehicles, tractors, lumber, logs, etc. Next is the gondola. The gondola is used to transport a heavy bulk amount of stuff such as sand, scrap metal, ore, such as iron ore or copper ore, logs, or a loose collection of elements known as aggregates. You could see that the sides, both sides are sort of sloped inward as you go down, kind of a bit trapezoidal, and it 
you know, could contain, you know, like a pile of aggregates or sand or anything like that. So that's the gondola. Next is the hopper. It's similar to the gondola in that uh, hoppers carry sand as well as coal, rock, cement, corn, wheat, barley, sugar, rice, etc. As you notice down here, it sort of slopes a lot, or I, would, I like to describe it as serrated in a way. Um, these are doors, and the doors open, and the stuff that's inside, like the coal, the sand, the rock, um, or, or whatever's inside, uh, will pour out um, by gravity. And finally, there are two types. There are covered and open top hoppers. So um, some of them have a ceiling and others don't. So it comes in two varieties. Okay, next is the well car, also known as well wagons or stack cars. So these are um, cars that have a well or a depression uh, to fit intermodal containers, which I'll uh, get to here shortly. Or right now, here are intermodal containers, um, and they're used to carry a whole bunch of uh, a different uh, freight, different uh, merchandises, almost anything uh, that you can imagine. They um, they transport in these intermodal containers, and then these go on semi trucks, like you see in the picture here. Here is a yard filled with intermodal containers or cargo containers. And then they could be loaded onto a ship, like this, and then from there placed on a train. And then the train could take it uh, to a place where it could be placed on a semi-truck, and then uh, the semi-truck could go to the location that uh, the, the merchandise or the, or the freight that's inside uh, belongs to. Let's say somebody made an order overseas. Uh, that's uh, one way of, of intermodal transport. Uh, the word intermodal means that you use two or more different modes of transportation when conveying goods or, or transporting goods from point A to point B. Uh, for example, like it, it could go on a train and then from the train it goes to a semi-truck and then from the semi-truck it gets to the destination. Um, or like in the example that I showed, it was on a boat first. Um, it could also have flown over on a plane. That's another mode of transportation. Alright, number six, uh, tank cars. Uh, these are tank cars. They're cylindrical in shape and they're typically utilized to carry liquid commodities uh, such as uh, water, fuel, chemicals, etc. Uh, typically uh, liquid. And I also read uh, sometimes gases as well and they could hold between 6,500 to over 31,000 gallons. Okay, let's move on to requirement number six. Name 10 types of cargo shipped in freight cars. So we have ballast. We'll get to that a little later, but um, basically ballast are, you know, stones or gravel or sand. And we'll, we'll get to that here shortly. Logs, livestock, automobiles, like the auto rack uh, freight car, for example, oil, paper, coal, syrup, cement, steel, and etc. Alright, requirement number seven. Do one of the following. Lay six feet or more of cork, roadbed, track, and ballast. So you have a couple of pieces of cork and a model railroad track that you lay on top of it and then pour ballast on top of it. Again, ballast is just crushed stone uh, rock like this and uh, show it to your commander or take a picture and show that to your commander. Or you could construct a railroad station uh, using a building kit, either plastic or laser. Or you could draw to scale the layout of a model railroad you would like to build. So in case you haven't had models in design yet, a model is a downsize scale replication of something that's much bigger. So to scale means like for example 1 to 100, that means everything in your model or your blueprint is 100 times that size. 
Okay, so requirement number eight, define switchback. Before I define switchback, let's talk about switches. So this is a switch. A switch typically um, takes a railroad track and diverges it into two, or takes two railroad tracks and converges it into one. So as you see down here in this GIF, let's say this train is going from point A to point B. Well, if you would switch it, it may go from point A to point C. It just depends on destination and what train that you decided to catch. Back in the day, people used to use dynamite, um, which was first used in, I believe, 1867. Uh, dynamite is nitroglycerin, which was discovered 20 years uh, prior to that. And they would um, carve tunnels inside rock, inside mountains. Um, but um, sometimes uh, you don't want to do all that hard work so you use the switchback so here's what a switchback is it's a zigzag road up a steep grade uh, like this so um, I'm going to use a, a little animation that I made using uh, GIFs and all that um, it's not going to be exact but it's just to get give you the idea First the train goes up part of the steep grade and stops right over here. And then uh, somebody gets out, typically the person in the caboose, and they uh, switch the tracks. And now they could go upward. They make another stop, switch again, and continue. And that's the idea of switchback. Okay, requirement number nine. List six manufacturers of model railroading supplies or equipment. We have Bachmann, which was founded in 1833. Athern. Woodland Scenics. Lifelike, Atlas Model Railroad, Model Power, and of course there's a lot more, but here are six of them. Okay, requirement number 10. Determine in HO scale how many feet are represented by three inches. You use the HO scale for models. So basically, we're talking about scale models, like I uh, defined to you um, here a few moments ago. Um, a scale model being a representation or a replication of something much bigger. You're downsizing a big object into something that you could hold with your hand. So what is an HO or H0 scale? It is a specific scale used for building model railroads and trains. The scale ratio for HO is 1 to 87. That means everything is 87 times bigger than what you see. Okay, that's what the scale ratio uh, means. So, if you have 3 inches of track, how many feet does that correspond to in real life? Okay, now if you're not like me and you hate math, then um, just continue to watch, but um, I encourage you to try it out, take out a blank sheet of paper, press pause, and try to solve it. Okay, so you have 3 inches, and you have to multiply it by 87. Uh, that's because in an HO model, everything is 87 times bigger. Therefore, it equals to 261 inches. So in your model, if you have 3 inches of track, in real life it is 261 inches, but how much is that in feet? Well, how many inches are in a foot? There are 12. So you take 261 inches, you divide it by 12, and that equals 21.75 feet. Therefore, if you have 3 inches of track in the HO model, in real life, that corresponds to 21.75 feet. Okay, requirement number 11, define ballast and tell what it is used for. Ballast is crushed rock or gravel. 
It is used as water drainage. It prevents vegetation and grass from growing up uh, through the tracks and around the tracks, which might interfere with the, the train passing through. And it adds stability to keep the track in place as the train rolls over it. Keep in mind, trains are extremely, extremely heavy. Requirement 12. Write where the engineer and the brakeman ride on a locomotive. The engineer sits on the right hand side and the brakeman sits on the left hand side. Also, the firemen, specifically in steam locomotives, would sit at the left hand side too. Okay, requirement 13, record the speed limit in a railroad yard. Typically, it's between 10 and 15 miles an hour, 10 or less to 15 miles per hour. Okay, requirement 14, in what type of engine was a whistle used? The steam engine. And here are our close-ups of the whistles. Okay, requirement 15. Determine how many 40-foot cars are in a mile. Okay, this is another math problem, and I believe the last uh, math problem. Um, again, uh, if you're like me and love math, uh, press pause and, and try and, and uh, solve this. But first, uh, let me give you a few hints. There are 5,280 feet in a mile. Okay, let's say that this car... Um, in this case, this would be a type of box car, it looks like, uh, from Canadian National, uh, is 40 feet across. But between the cars, there's still space. So let's just estimate there's a, an extra uh, 2 feet on both sides, or an extra 4 feet. So let's just say 44 feet. All right. Now, you take 5,280 feet, and you divide it by 44 feet, and that simply equals 120. So there would be approximately 120 40 foot cars in a mile. Okay, requirement 16. Name three types of fuels used in steam locomotives. Okay, one is wood, they would burn wood, coal, and oil. Okay, so here's briefly how steam locomotives work. The fuel would go inside the firebox right here. And then the hot gases would go through these pipes and out the chimney. Well, there's water in here. This part of the train is called the boiler, just to say. And there's water inside. Well, what happens when water gets so hot? Well, it evaporates into a gas. The gas expands. It creates a pressure right here. And the pressure is monitored out here in the cab. And long story short, the steam would make its way down here uh, where there's a couple of movable pistons. And they would move back and forth due to uh, the power of the steam. And that is what would turn the wheels. And that's what made steam locomotives move. See, uh, locomotives, uh, the motive refers to motion. Then there's diesel uh, locomotives, which uh, uses uh, diesel. That's where the oil is used as fuel. Okay, requirement 17. Define EOT and tell what it replaced. EOT stands for end a train device. It is a red light on the end car of a freight train. And here's a couple of, uh, of examples of one. And this replaced the caboose. Uh, the caboose was sort of like uh, the headquarters of some people that worked uh, for the train company. And during turns, they would typically stand out and look out and make sure that, you know, there's nothing up ahead and, and everything's working properly and there's no smoke coming from the tracks or the, or the wheels or anything abnormal like that. Uh, with the EOT, and there's a few types, um, it sends a signal... Uh, to uh, the people up front in the cab um, instead of uh, the people uh, that would work in the caboose. And so it kind of it took away jobs from people at the same time. Okay, requirement 18. 
Tell what kind of railroad used Shea engines. Well, first of all, what is a Shea engine? It's a steam locomotive that uses gears. And logging and coal trains would use Shea engines. And here's an example of one. Okay, requirement number 19. Name three types of locomotive power. Okay, we've got the steam engine, which uses coal or wood to ultimately heat water. Uh, again, recall that this is the boiler right here. And we now know what happens in there. We have diesel, which burns oil. And electric. This um, train is connected to these electrical lines, which supplies it with electricity, and it helps this train move fast. Uh, faster than regular steam engines. Between diesel engines and steam engines, diesel engines run faster and work longer. And magnetism. The maglev or magnetic levitation uh, could go 267 miles per hour because it uses uh, two magnets to sort of raise it up a little bit, decrease the friction, and that's what makes it you know go so fast. This train comes from Shanghai, China and operates in China, Japan, and South Korea. Here's the SC maglev, or the superconduction maglev, uh, which could actually go faster at 375 miles per hour, and this one is in Japan. Um, I believe it's still in the working stages, but it did clock at 603 kilometers per hour, which is approximately 375 miles per hour. Okay, requirement 20. Match the scales in line B with the model railroad gauge names in line A. So here's lines A and B, and again, uh, these uh, refer to scale models, like if you're uh, building or manufacturing model railroads or trains. Uh, the scale ratio fluctuates depending on the manufacturer and country, just to say. In the Royal Rangers curriculum for this requirement, uh, it shows a different number than 22.5, uh, but a lot of sources um, use 22.5 instead. So let's recall the HO scale. Remember what the scale ratio was? It was 1 to 87. So that's a match right there. And all you have to do is just write down these letters, and then uh, next to it write down uh, the scale ratio. And the answers are right here for you to find. And a big congratulations for completing the railroading merit. Uh, just show your notes to your commander whenever you're finished and any models or pictures of models that, uh, that you have. And again, a big congratulations. Great job.